Before we start the Q&A period, I just uh, would like the uh, suppliers who helped out with the solutions to talk a little bit about what other industries their uh, applications are applied to. I don't want you to think that they just apply to the specific industries that their customer talked about. So we'll go left to right, start with Stephen, uh, in just a, you know, a few sentences about what other industries you play in. Sure, Ralph, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure sitting on the stage here and listening to the three customer testimonies, uh, all three are Oracle customers using our software. But we, uh, Oracle operates in 160 countries, but also in all 22 major market segments. We're very strong in high technology, medical, as well as industrial, including auto, aerospace, and defense, and the rest of the discrete and process industry. So we, we cover them all. Good, excellent. Brian? Yeah, I'm Brian Parsonet from C Corporation. Um, we are broadly applicable to uh, industrial continuous processes and batch processes. So refining, oil and gas, pulp and paper, ph pharma, um, chemical, uh, fine chem. Excellent, excellent. Sebesh? Hi, I'm from uh, Tata Consultancy Services, and uh, our services span to nine major verticals that includes the travel, hospitality, uh, manufacturing is a large part of it. And uh, I'm really glad that a lot of our customers are uh, in this premises, so it's a good forum. Uh, as far as the customer experience is concerned, I think uh, manufacturing is one of the most uh, laggard the industry to learn from. You must admit that. And I've been myself part of all 23 years in the manufacturing. Uh, we learn a lot from the travel and hospitality. Uh, look at the way airlines have transformed uh, the complete customer self service. Uh, each customer end up doing everything for themselves. Uh, whether you select the seats, uh, buy the tickets from any channels. Uh, so all this talk of omnichannel experience is actually learning from other industries. And that's what we are adopting uh, through multiple technologies, including my Oracle friends here, uh, <laughs> to enable those, uh, uh, the experiences, uh, the omnichannel experience. Excellent, thank you, thank you. So now we're open to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Preet has a microphone. If somebody would raise their hand if they have a question. Uh, I'll warn you, if you don't ask questions, I'm going to ask you guys questions. <laughs> Dave in the corner there. No valid question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, this is uh, this question. Oh, I'm Dave Clayton from ARC, by the way. Uh, and this question is for Sean. Um, regarding the customer's change behavior, Really a two-part question. Uh, if they're assuming they're used to scheduled maintenance, scheduled downtime for maintaining the valves, if your service um, predicts an alert that's going to cause them some kind of a downtime before it's planned, is there any kickback to that? And also, do they trust the service enough to maybe skip opening up a valve during a scheduled downtime? Yeah, good question. You know the. Um the way most of our customers operated in the past and, and we provided service was sending people out to do um, kind of a, a, a pre-shutdown walk down, right? So they, they walk down, they look at all the valves, they look at some information, maybe collect a little bit of diagnostic information if they can. And then based on that, you know, it's not great because they, they can't take the valves offline, they can't open them up. They're kind of making an educated guess about which valves to work on. You know, so maybe the customer has 100 valves, they decide which 30 that they're gonna focus on. And some of them definitely need help, some of them probably didn't. And, and uh, it's, you know, it's not a 100% hit right there. With, uh, with this particular service, what we're looking at doing is, you know, if we're, if we're trending that data over long periods of time, we're gonna know which you know, 20 or 30 valves need to be at the top of the list and help them prioritize those. Because not only uh, is it important to find the ones that need help, but we've also found out that you know, if, a, if a human opens up a valve that didn't need fixed and puts it back together, there's a possibility of actually making it worse. So, so yeah, we've, we've seen that uh, this could impact how we do our, uh, our, our pre-turnaround walkdowns. If I could ask Sean a follow-up question. I, I, from your presentation, I got a little confused at the, of the path that the data flow takes. Mm -hmm. Does it go directly from the valve to some local Wi-Fi and then to the internet, or, or does it go to some accumulator that's on the uh, network for the, uh, how, how does it go? Well, um, I probably didn't get real specific because um, there's not one answer right now. Oh, okay. And, and uh, we've got some cases where we strap on just standalone sensors and that just goes directly through cellular out, out, to, uh, out to the cloud. Okay. But uh, what uh, most of our system is built on is, is using, you know, on-site software such as Seek 
and helping us push that through the uh, network layers until it can get up to the cloud. Okay, yeah. all right, excellent. But, but yeah, there's not one implementation, there's, right. there's multiple. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another? I'm curious, for the OEMs, uh, have you started, as you've moved into these new service areas and analytical areas, have you had pushback from um, providers who maybe were doing that work previously um, before like maybe the automation providers or anything like that? Have you seen that sort of friction there? Are you saying friction? So as the OEMs are now doing, it's, it appear to be doing more of the analytical work that maybe previously had been done by someone else. And have you seen like pushback in that from that? Um, I wouldn't say I'd see pushback, but I think there is this common notion for uh, an attractiveness for the IoT where people not familiar with it think it's easy and they can just do the whole thing. And what's emerging is that there's really a lot of uh, segments uh, in the entire IoT flow of information and analytics and managing the data and service and everything else. And as the industry matures, it'll compartmentalize. And I think uh, if there is friction, that will get reduced as people understand what their role is. Now, our particular take is our mission is to enable subject matter experts. And the OEM is the subject matter expert. You cannot beat it. And if we can help them really find out how to uh, commercialize and accentuate and distribute that expertise cost effectively, there is no friction. We're helping their business. So uh, I wouldn't say there's friction now, and I think as the industry matures, I think it'll get more and more streamlined. Can I respond also, Ralph? Sure, yeah, please tell um, me. Over the last 20 years, we've had a group called IT and another group called OT. And I think over the last uh, two decades, we've seen these two circles merge, and I think they're touching on one another at this mm. point in time where OT finally meets IT, and thus we have the IoT, where now they all are agreeing to standards. So I, I think to answer your question, uh, everybody has analytics. Uh, the model and the formula and the algorithms that they're using may be slightly different. But IT finally meets OT, and I think we're talking about running on the same common platform, using the same common standards, collecting data in the same way, and having that data transported and being manipulated into some more data files right now a lot more accurately. So you know, I wouldn't say use the word pushback. I, I would say we're seeing a lot more cooperation now from people uh, working within this field because they know that we're really on just the doorstep of where we're going to be going with OTIT right now. Yeah. If I could just build on what Stephen said, uh, we've noticed in our client base, uh, if we go back 10, 15 years ago, you talk to somebody in OT, a control engineer, IT was evil incarnate. Uh, now we see a lot of people, over the, particularly over the past five years, who have mixed career paths, so, uh, and they actually uh, cooperate a lot more. There'll, there'll be people who had uh, control engineers who moved into IT and vice versa. We have people in our client base who are in IT and moved uh, into the control engineering space. So this, this divide, this cultural divide between IT and OT uh, definitely has broken down in the past 10 years. And this is an account by account. I'm sure some people could find an account where the divide hasn't been broken down. But uh, in general, we've seen a lot more cooperation between those groups. Anybody else want to reply? No? OK. Another question? Uh, I guess my question is for Sean. Could you comment on uh, uh, could you comment on uh, how quickly does the situation deteriorate on the valves, and how important is the data rate uh, in in achieving an effective solution in terms of re reliability? So, taking a daily feed versus an hourly versus a real time. Uh, Sure. Um, I, so the um, the main thing is, you know, control valves occasionally will experience a, a, a sudden failure, but it's actually pretty rare. In most cases, they are they are pretty slow, and, and it's pretty easy to uh, to see changes happen over long periods of time. I'd say a lot of times we're seeing failures um, start to um, show signs that they're beginning to develop for definitely weeks and sometimes months before it actually gets into an alarm condition. 
And so, so that gives us quite a bit of time to look at, it, especially if we're, we're paying attention to the right, right parameters. So, so we definitely get a long, long period of time, which actually helps a lot with being able to plan when we're going to work on the valve. You know, can it wait for a shutdown? Can it skip a shutdown? Or, um, or do we need to do something more immediate? So, so that's, uh, in general, most cases we're able to see things quite a ways in advance. And, and the, the data, you know, again, we would like to see it continuously stream if, if possible but there's some limitations with doing that, at least right now. Um, we found that even taking the data once a week has been, been very, very helpful, and we've made some, some really good um, uh, catches on, on valve deterioration just off the weekly data, but our, our plan is to get to where we're collecting data near real time or, or you know, many times a day instead of once a week. Excellent. Just a question to the whole panel, if you feel uh, you had any experience like that. What we found getting data, and I'm from Joy Global, so we gather a lot of data off of machines on the ground, is when you do get this data, especially in our control valves, you actually, apart from just using the data for equipment monitoring, you suddenly understand the whole process that the customer is running. So you can actually optimize this process for him. Have you had any experience like that, and what was it like? Do they push back? On, on the valve side, I can say that we, we have seen things like that because, you know, we're, we're ob obviously yeah. focusing on, on valve equipment failures, but there's been cases where you start to see, uh, um, you know, oscillatory behavior, for example. And we can look at our data and generally tell if that's coming because the, the control valve is tuned improperly or is it coming from uh, a bad process gain or, or bad controller gain on the outside. So, so we have been able to pick up things external to the valve that actually were not a valve problem. So, so we are able to sense a little bit beyond just the control valve itself. Now if we were to add more sensors or get access to process data if that was available, we could do much more. And uh, I'd just like to add on here the the manufacturers typically have ignored the uh, the service side of the affairs. You know, that's how it gave rise to a big service industry, whether it be to large equipment, transformers, or electricals, whatever. The uh, This is one piece, and uh, to Brian's point earlier as well, that the, now you have a, a complete hold on how the equipment is behaving, and this is the opportunity for the services and what we call as the internet of services now, that the, it's not only the things that you are collecting the data, but from your consultancy services, uh, the education services, and process optimization services around using this data for that. So um, just a word about that as well. So uh, Seek's core business is more on the process side than it is working with OEMs about a particular asset for, let's say, valves. But the, the model is identical. You have subject matter experts who are looking at a combination of data sources. And the way this works for us, in particular with valves, is that when the customer sees the Seek tool on the valve, they uh, at times want to combine it with process data. And when they do, it's bi-directional. The process data clearly can help with understanding what's happening with the valve. But when you're also looking at a process problem and you can disqualify the valve as being a source or you can identify the valve as being a source of some of the issue, it helps understand your process. These work very well together. So um, the, the important thing is that you have an understanding of the scope of the problem you're trying to address. You identify who the subject matter experts are. You need process expertise. You need equipment expertise. You might need uh, chemical expertise. You maybe need vendor expertise. And bring them into the right environment with that scope. And uh, they all help each other. It's not like there's one at the top of the, of the pinnacle, I'd say. Just let me add to that before I'll hand it to Ron as well. Uh, I think the important point here is uh, the term called owning the customer use experience, owning the customer use experience. And we heard three very good presentations, very compelling on remote diagnostics. And what that means is not only do you make a laser or a, a valve or a, a piece of hardware, machinery, a motor, but now that you're putting it in place for 20 or 30 years, how the customer is using it and what their reaction to that is part of your ownership. You own the customer user experience. And the way you own it is through the remote connection. So you have the opportunity to collect data. Uh, we heard that CERN, the, the uh, 
uh, the, the collider in Switzerland throws out a terabyte a second of data, phenomenal amount of information, or once a week you read a valve. But you own that customer use experience, and that's how you maintain customer lifetime value, right, Ron? So you want to capture that data, and you want to help the customer improve their operation, their performance. So rather than being a standalone operation, a standalone valve or a standalone laser, you're now amalgamating 200 or 1,000 different lasers that are out there, and you're offering a consulting service on how to operate that piece of equipment better. So owning the customer use experience, and that's part of the whole CX dimension, I think is what opens up the doorway here for a much higher margin, much higher, greater level, uh, like GE, you mentioned before about GE becoming a digital industrial. What the heck's a digital industrial? You, uh, you know, they, they advertise the locomotive, they advertise the jet engine, power by the hour, right? So the locomotive is now just a rolling computer center and f spilling out data, throwing off data, and they could improve the optimization of that engine with one engineer, with uh, biometrics and all of the logic to operate that train remotely. And the same with the airplane is gonna come, and the same with the car is gonna come, owning the customer user, user experience with remote diagnostics. I, I think that's the key, and that's where I, I see this heading. Ron, why don't you comment on it? Yeah, I think I, I agree completely that that's the direction it's going to go. With lasers right now, we are not in a monitoring situation, but as I mentioned, lasers are, have been fairly smart for a while. They've got log files on them. They're collecting data on what's going on. And what we've been finding is that, especially as we're going into more scattered end, end customer situations, the laser tends to be the canary in the coal mine. So if they've got poor quality uh, water or, or dry air or things that they're using within the plant that uh, aren't working, we're able, you know, we're able to see that pretty quickly. Um, often there's a laser failure associated with it, but we're able to help them with that. Additionally, for those applications which are a little bit more popular that, that we have a little bit more sense into, we're able to look at their use condition of the laser, how they're operating it, what's the, op what's the output power, the, 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 the laser parameters that, that we're monitoring on the system, and help them actually tune the process if they need to. Finally, I, I know uh, one big industrial competitor of ours, they're in a laser piece, but they're also in a, uh, in a much more industrial equipment. They're actually creating a, a platform, a software platform, which is intended to allow the other pieces of equipment to work together so that they can help manage that whole process, let them know when, when you know, there's a consumable that needs to be replaced or, or things of that nature. Definitely, I see it moving in that direction.